So this morning I wanted to talk about the theme of letting go as a kind of deepening of contentment. Because we're trying to be content with what we do have and let go of the things we don't, first of all. That's at a very basic level. But letting go in uh, Buddhism is called nekama. The Buddha called it nekama. And it's one of the three right intentions. It's the intention to make peace with, to let go of things that we don't need anymore, or things that are hurting us whether that be thoughts, mental patterns, um, or negative interpretations of things that are happening. And it's also similar to giving up and giving away. You know, we let go, we give. We give to others. It can also be um, related to what I spoke about yesterday, that little poem about the joy of missing out. So there's a certain happiness to renunciation, to letting go. That's why one of the um, types of happiness that the Buddha describes as um, being part of the jhanas is nikamasukha, the happiness, the bliss of giving away, of letting go, of renunciation. Yeah? So it deepens our understanding of contentment. And um, I think it's important to understand that this isn't the first step we take in meditation. First we have to learn how to meet our experience. The Buddha said suffering has to be fully understood yeah, in order to be overcome. So we first need to know how to meet it and how to accept it and have some understanding of suffering before we're in a position to let go. I, I hesitated to give this talk this morning because yesterday a lot of the questions were about meta meditation and I understand that it's important sometimes to have a sense of a resource within, like a sense of joy and happiness and um, loving kindness for oneself before we're able to let go, otherwise it can feel a bit like a void. But it's not a void. I mean, we've already been practicing, you know, with compassion, with love, with contentment. These are all sort of the similar words. And letting go is also an aspect of love. You know, love frees things. It gives things space. It doesn't control. You know, one of the greatest things you can do for a loved person when they're dying, for example, is not to keep clinging on, holding on to them. You know, saying, please stay for my sake. You know, I can't live without you. I don't have experience of losing a very close uh, person to me yet, except a, a dear friend, but it wasn't a family member or a teacher. That's more um, daunting for me. But I think that's the real challenge, to be able to allow people that we love to go and to say, I give you permission to die. Or I give you permission to live with someone else. You know, if you're happier with somebody else and you want to leave, that's okay, Go with all my blessings, with all my best wishes. So letting go is similar to love. And it's uh, also the opposite of clinging, obviously, right? <laughs> so in, in Buddhism we have this word upadana, and often it's translated as attachment, but I, I sort of don't really find that a very helpful word, partly because the opposite of attachment is detachment, and I think that can be misinterpreted as something quite cold and fairly aloof. And it also feels very final, you know, I've detached, I'm somehow separate. And I much prefer the literal translation, which means taking up, upadana. Adana is like take, it's the opposite of dana, which is to give, generosity. And upadana means to take up. So you can imagine it like a hand that lifts something up and holds onto it, you know, or grasps. Grasping is another really nice translation for upadana. And so the opposite of that is to let go of grasping. In other words, to put something down. Yeah? And there's a nice little um, story. I hope it's not a true story, actually, um, because I don't really like the idea of people catching monkeys, but there's this um, monkey trap <laughs> that apparently exists where um, they have a coconut shell and they make a little hole in the coconut shell just big enough for the monkey to get its hand into. But inside that coconut shell, they put a banana and they tie the coconut shell, of course, with a chain or something to the ground. And the monkey comes and wants the banana, puts the hand through. And it can't, let, it can't get its hand out of the hole. <laughs> and so the hunter comes along, or whoever it is that's supposed to catch this monkey. And the monkey won't let go of that banana. <laughs> because it's, it's decided this banana belongs to me, this is mine. And of course a lot of grasping and a lot of desire has already arisen in that monkey's mind. And how often is it that we do the same thing? We're, we're so attached to our views, to our, you know, identities, you know, maybe our gender identity or 
our religious or racial identity. And we just can't let that go. And again, you know, it's not good to just sort of say, right, I, none of that belongs to me, it doesn't, make, it doesn't really matter. Of course, we have to understand and accept ourselves and celebrate ourselves first of all, you know. One lady put it nicely, somebody that I don't even know, but sometimes you have these little discussions on social media. She said um, she, said she had a dream, actually, where Ajahn Chah appeared. He's a very uh, great forest master um, who was my teacher's teacher. And uh, she said he told her one thing. He said, make peace with yourself, <coughs> love yourself, there is no self. And I thought, wow, it's quite a profound dream, actually. <laughs> Because it's like someone said yesterday about contentment and abundance. First we think that making peace is a bit flat, you know, but then we realise it's actually very close to love and then it starts to feel abundant, right? And then when we have that sense of plenty, we can actually let go of the bits that are just causing us to cling, causing the suffering, causing the sense of ownership to happen, yeah? Which just spoils the whole thing. Because love, again, is something that frees so I kind of wanted to just tie in the love in, as far as possible to the letting go subject this morning. So I wanted to go back to the third noble truth, which I didn't um, go into in depth yesterday, um, which is the way out of suffering, yeah, the ending of suffering. And as the Buddha said, um, first of all, it's the fading away and the cessation of that very same craving and wanting that causes suffering. But further than that, he actually gave four beautiful words which mean um, letting go and which are more, in a way, positive and active. You can see these things as active or passive, really, but um, there are things we can do to <coughs> facilitate this process of letting go. So the first one is called chaga. And yesterday we were practicing a little bit of that, called chaganusati. Um, it's when we recollect our goodness we recollect other people's goodness, especially our virtue, our generosity, the things that we've given to others, the ways that we've been kind, the ways we've offered our time or our presence, our non-judgment. So it's a kind of sense of giving, yeah? Giving to others, giving to your meditation. Also giving away, giving things away that you don't need. So how many of us, you know, not me, <laughs> I, can be, I can be sure about this, I don't apply. How many of you have a lot of clothes in your wardrobe, you know, that are there just in case? Oh, you're admitting it. Wow, cool. So they're there, you know, and you think, oh, that one, yeah, I wear it most days, but the other sort of 600 pieces, <laughs> I'm exaggerating. I hope no one has 600. Um, <laughs> the other ones, you know, are, um, they're, you know, I might use them someday. And there might be a party or there might be some kind of special event or I don't know something I need to look smart for, so I'll keep it there just in case. But that's a kind of clinging, and in the meantime, perhaps someone else could make use of that. Maybe you could donate to charity or donate to some kind of, um, what do you call those programs, that relief aid, you know, that go out to other countries and help in disaster areas or, or whatever. So we can give a little bit up, yeah? And of course that goes very deeply in line with the path because the whole movement of this path is not to attain things but to let go of things and to start giving, 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 being generous. And it dissolves the sense of self, you know, because it's when we have a strong sense of self that we think we need to own or have or possess. So this starts connecting us to others, you know. Yeah, it's nice for me to have things but it's nice for you to have things too and I want you to have enough. The Buddha even talked about generosity as one of the main principles of harmony, living together harmoniously in community with others. You know, being able to share whatever material um, things have come to you, even the contents of your arms bowl. And of course, share other beautiful things like one's virtue or one's wisdom. And then the next one is called Patinissaga, and that sort of more literally means like throwing away, throwing things away. Throwing away these tiresome self-images that really limit us. Yeah? Giving that up. Just throwing them away. Not in a negative way, but just, okay, I don't need this. My teacher, Ajahn Brahm, has a really nice simile for this, which is like a hot air balloon. He says, um, it's like you're going up in this balloon and you want to fly high, but there's all this ballast on the balloon that stops the balloon ascending. And so the first thing you start to do is see what things you don't need. Throw some of the material stuff out. 
So that's the first step, the material. And then you want to go higher, you want to go higher. And you start thinking, well, what else can I throw away? And after a while, you realize you have to throw away the basket of the balloon. That's something a bit more scary. Maybe that applies to, say, the body, right? And then to go higher, you have to throw more and more out. And eventually, you have to throw yourself out. <laughs> so the balloon just goes off. So this doesn't mean we die or we annihilate ourselves. This just means we stop um, assuming a sense of self, clinging to a sense of self, and giving ourselves a huge headache over that, you know, always worried about how we appear to others and, you know, having to kind of um, try to control the things which are actually out of our control. So Patinisaga is also related to a word called Vosaga. <coughs> There's a few different words in the Pali Canon which have this saga and it sort of means giving up, giving away. <coughs> and... Um, one of the things that the Buddha says is, um, in Pali, he says, Vosagaramana paritva labati samadim labati chitte kagatam. And that means something like, when we make letting go, giving up our main aim or our objective, or if you like, the movement of our mind, then we attain stillness, we attain one-pointedness or oneness of mind. Yeah? Because you've given up everything else. So yesterday when we meditated, I tried, I mean, maybe there was a bit too much instruction, but I tried to um, start us off with, you know, being aware of more diversity, like through the body, so we get a sense of the whole of what's happening. And then gradually, if the mind's getting stiller, we move towards simpler objects. So bit by bit, we came to the breath. And if the mind wasn't ready for that, that's fine. You know, I'm trying to sort of give everybody a chance to do what works for them. But, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you're aware of. You can just remain with that kindness, with that right attitude. But as the mind stills, you find it's easier and easier to focus on one thing, and that perception refines itself to become quite simple. Yeah, so we're moving from diversity to unity, and that's the kind of ekagata, the oneness. So the next one is muti, and it literally means freeing. I suppose it means freedom. I'm not, oh, it might mean freeing. But I like to think of these as verbs, things we can do. Yeah? So we free ourselves. It's not just a final state. It's something. It's an attitude, a movement of the mind we can have in our practice. So we free ourselves from wanting, first of all, because this wanting is the biggest kind of ballast that holds us down and that makes us never satisfied and always discontent with where we are. We might be partially content, but not fully. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah, I'm getting there with the breath, but when's the nimitta coming? You know, that, that's discontent. And so you're letting the hindrances back in, and that actually impedes the whole process. Yeah? The natural process is a process of deepening, stilling, simplifying. And then, uh, yeah, freeing ourselves from negative attitudes as well, of course. You know, freeing ourselves from anything that holds us back. And the last one is called Analia, and I like this one because it's, um, it literally means like no abode or no um, storage house, um, nowhere to rest, nothing to stick to. Yeah, so it's like our minds become, Ajahn Brown says, like Teflon. Things come in and just slip off, so especially things like praise and blame. Yeah, this is really difficult, isn't it, when we're unfairly blamed for something we haven't done or unfairly praised, but that's usually we don't mind too much. <laughs> yeah. So in the Buddhist suttas, there's many places that talk about how to respond to praise and blame, and, and one of them is really lovely. It says, um, others may address you in five ways. Their speech may be timely or untimely. It may be true or untrue. They may speak gently or harshly, with a mind of loving kindness or with a mind of inner hate or aversion or just irritation. And it may be for your benefit or for your harm. But um, the monks should determine thus, and the nuns, um, I will remain compassionate for their welfare. I shall utter no, um, I shall harbour no hate, no ill will, and utter no um, bad or unkind, cruel words. So this is how we have to train ourselves, to just allow things to come in and allow them to go. That's not your property, that's their property. There's another nice simile in the suttas about somebody called, um, I think it's a story in the suttas, it could be the commentaries, called Bharadvaja, and he was a Brahmin, and he came to the Buddha very angry because all his uh, family members had started to 
practice meditation instead of all their Brahmin rites and rituals. And uh, so he came to the Buddha and said, you bald-headed good-for-nothing, you know, what are you doing? You're spoiling my family traditions, da, 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 da. And the Buddha said to him, Brahmin, suppose someone comes to your home and they offer you a gift. What happens if um, that person doesn't accept the gift? The Brahmin says, well, the gift remains with them. And he said, yes. And similarly, similarly, you've come to my house with a gift of all this abuse and I don't accept that gift. It's your problem. It remains with you. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest saying that to somebody. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a good attitude to have, isn't it? To realise that this is that person's problem if they're coming with a lot of aggression and anger. Even if there's some truth in it, you're hardly likely to notice it because all you notice is their defiled mind. So that person is, you know, suffering. And they're not in a balanced state of mind, so it's not going to be objective. Whenever you're angry, you cannot be objective. You know, we see things coloured by these, like, red glasses, and everything looks far more, um, yeah, upsetting or unfair than it really is. Yeah, you're just focusing on the negatives. So you know that if somebody's angry with you, they're not being objective. And equally, if you're angry with another person, it's not the right time to approach them and talk about things. Wait until your mind's balanced, until you can see it a little bit from their side, you know, and you can at least think, okay, well, what was going on for them? And you can approach it from there. Yeah? So, yeah, I've just made a note here about another quote from Ajahn Chah, because I like to quote these teachers, they're very clever. He said, uh, he's a bit cheeky as well, so he said, um, if somebody abuses you, um, and they call you, for example, a dog, he said, it's very easy. You just look behind you and check it out. Have you got a tail? If you've not got a tail, you're not a dog. <laughs> so I like this kind of way of thinking. It's really nice. And it also means, you know, we can be open maybe to the message that's contained there. But, yeah. Trying not to respond from a place of anger is a very important letting go for all of us. So I wanted also quickly to talk about uh, a little bit of how to use perceptions of non-self to deepen the contentment and to deepen the letting go. Because this is really, you know, the crux, in a way, of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha said that, you know, none of the five khandhas, these components of what we take to be a self, the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations or reactions, sometimes translated as will, and the consciousness, he said, none of these things, me, mine, or a self, they don't belong to us. And he said, abandon what is not yours. It could be for your good and benefit. You know, why keep what is not yours? In a way, that means, like, why keep worrying about them? Why keep trying to fix them, trying to control them? Yeah? He said here... Bhikkhus, what do you think? If people carried off the grass, sticks, branches and leaves in this jata grove, or burned them, or did what they liked with them, would you think, people are carrying us off, or burning us, or doing what they like with us? No, venerable sir. Why not? Because that is neither oneself, nor what belongs to ourself. And so too, Bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. And when you've abandoned it, it will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And what is not yours? Material form is not yours. Feeling is not yours. Perception is not yours. Formations are not yours. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead for your, to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And again, abandoning it means learning not to take it as me, mine or a self. So starting to understand that these things are causally arisen, they're produced from causes, and they're subject to change constantly. And in the Anattalakana Sutta, the Buddha said, whatever is subject to change is suffering, and therefore it cannot be me, mine, or a self. It leads to affliction. It doesn't lead to happiness. So if we look at our body, it's quite easy to see that our body cannot really be taken as a permanent self. Imagine how it's changed throughout your life, you know. Which body is you? Are you that little two-year-old toddler? Or are you the teenager? Or are you the body and the shape of your body today? You know, what happens if you have an injury, something terrible, like you lose a limb? 
Is that arm yours? Was it yours when it was attached? How far away from you does it have to be not to be yours? So we think of these things as ours because they're so close to us. But if we look at another person's body, we never assume that to be ours. It's the same stuff, you know, it's flesh, blood, bones, pus, sinews, all sorts of yucky stuff. (laughs) <laughs> but we never think that as somebody else's you know. is our dandruff ours? it probably has our DNA but once it's not on our body anymore it's not ours when it's attached we think it's ours you know? so this body can't really be self and the Buddha likened it to a bubble like, sorry not a bubble a piece of foam you know, so sort of flimsy and insubstantial and not solid mm. also things like allergies you know, my allergies have changed over time. My conditions changed. You know, the the sicknesses or the diseases in my body has changed. So which one's which body is me? And then feeling in a similar way, like feeling really relates to any experience of the body or mind, which is pleasant, unpleasant, or or um, somewhere in between, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Maybe the kind of feelings that you think are kind of dull or a bit neutral or, yeah, kind of can't really discern them very clearly. You know, are any of these ours? The Buddha said if they are, we'd be able to say, may my feeling be this way, may it not be that way. But we can't, you know, we can't sit down and say, may my body not ache. Even if we try and adjust our cushion, you know, it still aches. You think, all right, I've just got the right perfect position now. But the next time you sit down in that way, it'll be a different... (laughs) <laughs> problem, you know, another part of the body will hurt or you'll have to move it differently. So we have to constantly adjust. For me, it's been interesting with um, my stomach condition because all the food I used to find really delicious has changed because it's no longer good for me. So even what I interpret as pleasant and unpleasant has changed. So am I the person that finds Thai and Indian food delicious or am I the person that prefers plain boiled vegetables and stuff? <laughs> potatoes, you know. <laughs> I used to think garlic was so yummy that people should use it as a perfume. <laughs> but now if I smell it, it gives me a very unpleasant sensation. I actually feel quite nauseous. So all these pleasures and pains and how we interpret them, that's the perception, the way we evaluate and identify experience. This too is impermanent. We can't take it as a self. And I find this very freeing, especially when um, it comes to the perception, because the Buddha said it's like a mirage. And one really lovely quote he said was that, um, well, he said it's a, there's something called vipalasa and sanya vipalasa. It means a kind of distortion of perception. And he said uh, what the world, worldly people or the unenlightened people say is happiness, the enlightened ones say is suffering. What the enlightened ones say is happiness. The ordinary folks who are unenlightened say is suffering. Isn't that interesting? So we actually can't be quite sure about how to define (coughs) pleasure in a proper way, in a wholesome way. And I think this is really interesting because it, it means we can start to doubt our perceptions. And especially when it comes to others, that's quite freeing. You know, maybe we've got them wrong. Because perception constantly sort of looks in ways that reinforce our own view. You know, we look for things that reinforce the way we want to believe things to be. And we filter out every other possible perception. So if I think I'm like a nervous person, then after the talk I'll be, or before the talk, I'll be thinking, oh dear, you know, I I feel nervous that I've got this butterfly in my tummy or whatever. And then I won't actually notice all the times that I'm really confident you know, and all the evidence that points to the contrary. I'll only notice one particular thing and hone in on that. So when we start doing practices like developing contentment or especially practices like loving kindness, it's really interesting because we're actually cultivating different perceptions. And especially with loving kindness, I think there's a great scope for wisdom to arise. Because you start to see the whole world differently when you have a mind of metta. So when you have, a say, a mind of aversion, of course, or even just an ordinary mind, the sort of usual mind you're accustomed to, not particularly full of metta and love for all beings. So when you do develop these metta states, it's really interesting. I've noticed that I tend to look at my whole life in a very different light, and things that happened in the past that at the time seemed unpleasant, I think, oh, 
it was so great that that happened because that happened, it led to this and then it led to that and the whole life has been so wonderful, <laughs> you know, and this person who I've had difficulties with is just a really soft and sweet person deep down inside. And everything looks different. You also feel much more positive about your future and about what you're doing, you know. Uh, much more able, actually, um, to be effective in the world because we've got a resource mind. And it's interesting when we work with the different categories. We send loving kindness to the friend, we send loving kindness to the neutral person, to the person we have difficulties with. And after a while, the neutral person, even though you didn't really know them or have any particular feeling, if you're in a retreat centre and they walk past, you start to feel quite fond of this person. And so they change categories. They actually start to become the friend. Of course, we can have the opposite, right? Where a friend becomes then an enemy later on in life. It all turns nasty and things change. So again, our perceptions change. And I've had lots of experiences in monastic life, and I suppose beyond it, but I can barely remember life beforehand. <laughs> no, that's not true. I can remember, it's interesting, my memory is really sharp from the time I started to practice. And my childhood's not so sharp at all. But, uh, yeah, I've had lots of experiences where, you know, people have sort of given me feedback, for example. And it's incredible that sort of ten different people can have ten completely different perceptions of exactly the same thing. Like once I uh, was in a class, a sutta class, and I uh, was asking lots and lots of questions. And I didn't realize I was asking far too many questions and taking up all the space till towards the end. And, uh, and then I felt quite mortified because I'd been judging someone else for just the same thing in a previous uh, sutta discussion class. And, uh, and so I decided to sort of apologize to people and say, I'm sorry, you know, I got a bit carried away. You know, hope you didn't mind. And the first person was like, well, it's good that you know it. <laughs> and kind of turned away <laughs> with a frown and a scowl and, uh, and so I thought oh dear I'd better apologise to everyone then uh, so I, I went to the next person they said oh did you I didn't notice <laughs> I was like oh okay so then I went to another person who was washing the dishes at the time and they said oh actually I really like your questions they really had a depth to them thank you very much for asking mm -hmm. And then, I mean, just to express the range of views, I went to someone else who's a, um, a really good meditator, and I asked her, and she said, thank you so much for asking those questions. I understand something more deeply now, and I want to ordain. <laughs> so isn't it amazing? We just don't know, you know, how people interpret things. I mean, what's correct? This is the other really interesting thing. When you practice with cultivating different perceptions, you realize it's so malleable. Which one is correct, actually? And then you realize none of them are correct because we're still not enlightened. We're still not seeing things as they really are. But some perceptions are more conducive to the wholesome states developing than others. And it's these kind of perceptions that we need to develop. But understanding they're still conditioned, they're still fabricated... But states like loving kindness are much less fabricated, less conditioned than states of aversion, which, because states of aversion are fueled so much by a sense of self and by delusion. And with metta, we're starting to undermine the hindrances. So whenever the hindrances start to be undermined, we can, it's a little bit more reliable. Our perceptions are a bit more reliable at that time than at other times. Yeah. So again, a bit of a promotion there for metta practice. <laughs> And then the last one is, uh, is consciousness itself. And this is really interesting because the Buddha is saying consciousness is not yours either. You know, and that's usually the bit which we do find difficult to accept as not belonging to me. And one way I find quite helpful to look at it is to realize that there are six consciousnesses. There's the eye consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body, ear, mind, and uh, is that it? Mm -hmm. Physical touch. Um, yeah, body consciousness. And all of these are separate and different. The nose can't hear. <laughs> the tongue can't... Well, it can feel, but taste, taste buds can't... Um, okay, can't uh, see. We don't have little eyeballs in our tongues. <laughs> so these are all kind of different, and they're not actually operating at the same time. So I've been told by people who've seen this. They actually arise one after the other in lightning <coughs> speed. 
<laughs> and the Buddha said somewhere in the suttas, I meant to write down the quote because I love it, but he said somewhere that it's actually better to take the body as self than to take the mind as self. Because the body at least lasts for some time. We can see it right here. It hasn't changed much in the last you know, half hour. But the mind, he said, is changing constantly, more quickly than we can keep up by day, by night. Changing in an instant. Mm-hmm. So, and, and in the Anattalakana Sutta, in the, um, I think it's in the Kanda Samyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya, for people who are interested, chapter 22, and, uh, or section 22, the Buddha actually goes through all these five Kandas and says that any kind of form, any kind of consciousness, feeling, perception, mental formation, whatsoever, whether far or near, inside or outside, coarse or supple, superior or inferior, what else? That'll do. Far or near. (laughs) Any kind whatsoever is not me, not mine, not a self. That means even so-called, what do you call that? Mm. Mm, Not unconditioned awareness. The Hindus call it something like um, paramatma, universal consciousness or something like that. The Buddha is saying even this is not self. So we can't take a self in any of these places. And it's really a relief to start thinking like this. And it, is a, it can be a slightly, um, I wouldn't say dangerous, but difficult teaching sometimes because people can slip into a sense of like, oh, there's nobody here, therefore I'm not responsible for my actions. That's not the thing at all. We are responsible because whenever we generate any sort of intention, um, or, you know, physical or verbal action, they have consequences for ourselves and other people. And that's why it's so important for this whole path to be motivated by compassion. You know, there is something here. We are sitting here together. You know, we do suffer. So at the apparent level, that's the case, you know. The Buddha's not saying that there's nothing there. He's just saying that what is there is being wrongly apprehended to be a self when it's actually just a causal process. So when we can start to see it as a causal process, it has great implications for our practice because we can start to modify the causes, be more careful about the kind of causes we lay down and have a look at what leads to what. So for example, in your meditation, when you observe things with kindness, what's the feedback? What sort of feedback does your body give you? Maybe it starts to tingle or feel relaxed. What kind of effect does it have on your mind? Have a look at that. And if it leads to peace, then you know that's that's kindness, that's letting go, that's contentment. Yeah? So we start to play with perceptions and start to learn about cause and effect and how that works in our practice to bring us to Nibbana. And I do want to end with one little quote because it's very beautiful. And this is um, a description of Nibbana that the Buddha discusses in the 64th Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. And he first of all says that we have to turn away from the five khandhas. He says, turn away, abandon the five khandhas, because that's not where Nibbāna is found. So turn away and turn the mind towards Nibbāna. And I think this is very beautiful. He says, this is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, the stilling of all formations. That means everything that's created and the one or the thing that's creating. The stilling of all formations, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, giving away, especially giving away those things that don't belong to you. The destruction of craving or wanting, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. So we've got time to do a bit of meditation now. If you can manage without a break, that would be great because there's only 20 minutes. So just stretch and adjust your position however you like. If you want to lean against the wall or sit on a chair, that's fine. We don't always have to take the same position in every session. 
So however you feel comfy. And I'm going to give a little bit of guidance. You Again, you're free to follow it or not as you wish, whatever helps you. Maybe a little bit of experimentation this morning. So closing your eyes. Turning away from sight and the impressions of the eyes. Coming in contact with your own body, letting the impressions of this room fall off your screen. And we're going to do a little imagination exercise just to set us off. We're going to imagine that we're sitting under a tree, a very big, beautiful, sturdy tree. On the bank of a river, in a warm part of the world. The trees offering us shade. A cool breeze may be blowing around your face. Very gentle breeze. And there's no one else around. Imagine you're the Buddha sitting under this tree. Fully enlightened. Completely content. You've done what had to be done. There's no more wanting or desire. You're absolutely free. How would that feel? Fully at peace with life. No more anger or ill will. Wanting for nothing. Your heart is free.
All you need to do is enjoy the peace, the silence, the freedom, like a wellspring from your heart. This is peaceful, this is sublime, the stilling of all formations, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Whatever arises in your mind, you understand this is not me, this is not mine, this is not a self, just an aspect of nature arising due to conditions and passing away when those conditions cease. Feelings come into existence. Stay for a while and pass away. Not me, not mine, not a self. There's no need to do anything about it. But just sit back and allow nature to manifest and all phenomena to pass away. You're the peaceful sage, fully at peace with experience, no more fighting with the world. the world of this body and mind. Enjoying the silence. Free from all concerns. The mind settles down.
And at times you may forget that you're now fully enlightened. And the mind carries on with its old habits of clinging, or not wanting, discontent. But then you remember, none of this belongs to me. There's nothing more I need to do. All the happiness I could ever wish for is inside. So you just let go and let nature arise and pass away. Keeping the contentment in your heart, allowing the perceptions of the river and the trees to fade away. You find yourself in your body, sitting on this cushion, in this Dhamma hall, with all the people around you, who you've spent the last couple of days with. And just reflecting on the meditation, what was it that drew you away from contentment? Were you trying to control your experience? How 
how did it feel to let go and understand that things are not me, not mine, not within my control? to end, just send yourself thoughts of loving kindness and appreciation for your practice. And on the third ringing of the bell, you can open your eyes.